While conflict rages in the Middle East, we have a big gas problem in the United States. And that gas problem is not what you might think it is. In fact, if you haven't noticed already, prices around the country are falling at the pump as I speak. And it's falling even more in wholesale conduits, in wholesale markets, which means that for whatever prices have already fallen across the U.S., they're likely to go even lower throughout October. Now, here's the thing. Again, conflict in the Middle East. Oil prices are up. They're volatile. They're moving all over the place. But over the last month or so, gasoline has decoupled from oil. And that's a significant thing because that never happens or almost never happens. Very, very rarely do we see gasoline go like this and oil go like this because, as most people know, Oil is the largest cost for gasoline. So we have to figure out what's going on here because wholesale gasoline prices don't just plunge in a vacuum. And it's not related to the Israel-Gaza uh, conflict that's going on here because, again, that's, oil prices are all over the, all over the place where, where it comes to that. Uncertainty on geopolitics. This is more about demand and the potential for demand destruction. So let me throw out some numbers here. According to AAA, the national average for today, and today is Saturday, October 14th. Today, the national average for regular gasoline was $3.60 and nine tenths of a cent. So $3.61. Yesterday, it was $3.63. So it's already down about three cents. A week ago, it was $3.72. And a month ago, in the middle part of September, $3.86. That's lagging. As I said, the big drop is in wholesale gas prices, and wholesale gas prices have fallen off a cliff at the end of September. So over the last month, from 273 on September 12th to 260 on September 27th, all the way to 217 as of Thursday. Now, it was back up about a dime yesterday, but we're talking about the lowest wholesale gasoline price since last December. Wholesale gasoline prices go down. Retail gasoline prices are going to follow through the month of September. What is going on here? Let's ask Mr. Stephen Van Meter. Steve, wholesale, retail, gasoline price. Oil's going this way. Gasoline's going this way. It sounds like there's a mess here. Yeah, Jeff, this doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Because if you look at the inventory levels at Cushing, Oklahoma, WTI feeds into gasoline prices. We're staring at empty tanks. I mean, lots of them. So wait a minute. You would think, I mean, just for a moment here, that if supply, which we can say is, is low, then price must go higher. But you're telling me, wait a minute, no, price is going down. We do know the inventory levels are extremely low, near historic lows. So something here is not adding up. I mean, it almost sounds like what you're trying to tell me is demand's evaporated. Yeah, and demand specifically for gasoline because... That is something that you and I talked about just last week. We brought up the Energy Information Administration's figures on gasoline supplied, which is a proxy for demand, which had fallen off a cliff through September. And it rebounded a little bit in the first week of October, these latest weekly figures, but not a whole lot. And so you look at the big picture context, what we're seeing here, Steve, and you know this, is that gasoline prices are validating the information the government has been giving us all summer. And what they've been saying is all, all summer, Americans, and not just American, you know, American families driving to vacations, but also American businesses. Maybe they're not delivering as many goods. Maybe not as many people are driving to work or they're, they're still driving to work, but they're not driving to work as frequently or they're doing something else because the price of wholesale gasoline, especially decoupling from uh, crude oil, suggests that something has happened on the demand side of the equation here. Yeah, because Jeff, we look at you know the, the demand from the consumer. There's three key things we have to look at, housing, food, and energy. So we have to assume that housing's relatively stable. I know, you know prices have gone up and we do know that here in the future, we're gonna see it stabilize as rents you know, stop increasing as much. We've seen some data on food that says that you know prices are indeed coming down and will hit hit the, the grocery stores here in a matter of months. So we know that's somewhat stabilizing. So you would think about this from the energy side, you get a spike in energy due to its 
the Israel conflict, well, that means gasoline prices go up. And then all of a sudden you see the consumer start to cut back on their discretionary spending because they, they can't deal with this additional variable. The economy is not growing too much. But what they're telling us, and this is interesting, that they're cutting their usage of gasoline now. Maybe, maybe, do you think maybe it could just be because the student loan repayments are back? I mean, maybe that's a factor here. It, we, we don't have enough data to say why. What we're just seeing is the consumers react to the fact that they don't have enough money. And the one thing they can control is where they drive. Yeah, I think that's it's it's what something has changed and it changed before we got to October. It was you could see it coming in August and into September again, using just the wholesale gasoline price. It's it peaked all the way back on August 11th at almost three dollars per gallon. And so since then, it's down to 217 at the low. I mean, we're talking about a third, 30 percent drop uh, in what, just about two months there. And it's during the same period in question we're talking about. I mean, consumers are thinking student loan repayments, uh, gasoline at three dollars wholesale. And where was it? Uh, retail. It was up to around almost four dollars a gallon retail. I mean, that was a huge cost to start the summer, which triggered this process. As we've been talking about, incomes have been slowing down despite the payroll report from the BLS, which was a statistical catch up. We know the labor market is slowing down. We know incomes are slowing down in nominal terms. So it was it was a it was a matter of which was going to be the spark that finally broke demand here. And that's what we're, I think what we're really getting toward is that we look at wholesale gasoline prices, especially decoupling from oil prices, which are entirely supply driven here. What we're saying is it looks like something broke. Now, gasoline prices can't tell us what that was, but it's not hard to think, you know, look around the economy and say, you know, despite what Jay Powell's been talking about and all the economists on TV, this resilient system. no. We've been we've been hearing the noises. We've been hearing the creaks and cracks all along. And I think people just got a little bit they got normalized to it. They tuned it out and said, oh, the economy's fine. Everything. It didn't fall off a cliff in May. So everything must have been fine by the time we got to August when it was just slowly moving in that direction, just waiting for the like the analogy you always use, Steve, the Jenga tower. Somebody pulled that last that last block out and it feels like now we're starting to fall over. Yeah. So the, the thing is, I think you're, you've got this right, Jeff, is we just don't know what else, what changed. We, we're seeing it. Uh, in fact, here in Orlando, we know this is a vacation capital of the world. One thing I've noticed is the Disney parks are now offering discounts in the next year. Uh, they came out, for example, with a water park pass for residents only. Now, in the past, you had to have an annual pass and be a resident to get it. And still, demand just evaporated. People I I used to see there, I messaged them, hey, I haven't seen you. Well, like, oh, yeah, I let my pass expire. I don't go anymore. And, of course, the park workers say, oh, it's weather related. So, no, it's, it's not entirely weather related because they said it wasn't this bad last year or the year before. They said, oh. This is the worst it's been in a long time. And so, Jeff, that tells me is when consumers look out and say, hey, you know what? I can't afford to go do fun stuff with my family because the money has changed. We, what we don't know is the data just hasn't caught up to the fact we can see it. And that's what you and I have been talking about is the economy here is likely to hit a wall. And perhaps what we're seeing in the gasoline data is that that wall is here. We just don't know exactly what it looks like yet. Yeah, we don't know where it ends up. And thank you for that update to the Stephen Van Meter Disney Park Attendance PMI. We needed an update on that. And that it's but it, you know, it goes to it's exactly what you said. You know, the Jenga the Jenga analogy, I think, is really a good one because at, at all the stuff that was happening really since March and April, we got the bank crisis, we got the credit crunch, people stopped talking about it, but it's still happening. We still see credit being curtailed, not just to consumers, but really more so to businesses. So credit is being curtailed. We saw income slow down because that's part of it too. The labor market uncertainty, student loan repayments. And then along comes this, this surge in gasoline prices back in July and August that we saw in the CPI that got everybody talking about the September CPI that was boosted by largely gasoline. In August and September together, gasoline accounted for one third of the entire increase in the CPI in both of those months. The other big chunk, 40 some percent, 42.6 percent, was shelter prices, which is entirely fake and made up. So most of the CPI over the last couple months was gasoline and shelter. And here we are talking about gasoline falling off a cliff and retail gasoline prices about to go with it. 
So we know that the gasoline component in October, for those who are considering the direct impact of what we're talking about on something tangible, well, maybe the CPI isn't tangible, but the CPI in October is already set up with neg negative gasoline prices to be substantially lower than it is today. So it may be that the CPI is going to catch up next, uh, next month for this month with where economic reality is. And then we can have a conversation about what that, uh, what, really starting about what that actually means. So Jeff, maybe this is what the central bankers have wanted all the time. I mean, we hear this, right? The monetary policy works with long variable labs. Well, lags. Well, how variable we don't know, how long we're still not sure. Maybe this is it. Maybe finally we're at that point where the teeth of higher interest rates are kicking in. Powell's going to get what he wants. He's going to trim rates going into next year. Maybe another hike in December. We'll see trim rates into early next year, get down to you know what the nominal rate needs to be to have the economy growing and say, look, I got it. I nailed the soft landing. Maybe that's maybe it's just nothing more than central banker perfection that we're seeing. Yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. Mean, perfection is probably way too strong a word, and you know that. I think what's going to happen here is if the economy continues to move in this direction, at the initial part of it, they're going to say, yeah, we did that. Yes, we see the, 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 the serious weakening developing. We see the disinflation, maybe even a little bit of energy price deflation, maybe even a lot of energy price deflation moving ahead. And they'll say, we did that. We, intended, we told you we we're going to do that. But then if the, the little bit of deflation becomes a little bit more deflation and the little bit of weakness in the labor market becomes a negative payroll number, then a bigger negative and then a bigger negative than that. They're going to start changing their tune and say, oh, we better get with the program here and stop talking about we did this and say, what are we going to do about it? So there will be a window there where the Fed is going to have the the uh, the moment where they have the banner behind them that says mission accomplished. They're definitely going to do that. And Jay Powell is going to have a press conference where he says, this was all us. We did this. We destroyed enough of the economy. Of course, he's not going to say that, but. We did this with our rate hikes and we got us into a perfect soft landing until we realized that the soft landing isn't actually happening. If we look at, again, going back to the, the premise here, the gasoline number tells you that's not soft landing type of material here. This is more than that, especially with gasoline uh, decoupling from oil. Right. And then if you look at you know, what's going on in Israel, we're hearing projections now. If this is an all out war that some of the banks are saying and their analysts that oil could go to 150 a barrel. Now, of course, if we keep gasoline and oil coupled together, that means gasoline prices skyrocket, absolutely obliterates the U.S. economy. Now, if you're a Fed chief, this is exactly what you need, because as soon as the data hits what you want, like you said, you put the banners up, you say, see, we did this. And then literally the next week you say, yeah, but we didn't see that coming. And so it's not our problem that everything spiraled out of control. We'll cut rates a little bit and then we'll cut rates a lot. So it's beautiful that they always have a scapegoat somewhere. Somehow they get out of this. I don't know how they do it, Jeff, but they're going to. The, the key here is what if we do see oil prices just rocket higher? We don't want to see that. But what if we do and gas prices continue to stay go fall or stay low? It tells you that the man picture for the U.S. consumer has changed in a, sig not a significant way. We're not talking a little change. We're not talking, hey, we went out to eat one less time a month. We're talking massive change here. And that's what's frightening. Yeah, gasoline isn't about, you know, some small little trivia. Uh, it's not about, you know, buying this, buying something from the uh, from the counter at Walmart, you know, for going on that. I mean, gasoline is essential. It's 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 one of those non-discretionary parts of the budget. You have to drive to work. You don't want to, but you got to do it. And if you have to try to, I mean, people ride sharing here or whatever they're doing to to uh, make up for the price of gasoline, that's the, that's the real scary part because you're right, Steve, if Oil prices do continue to go up um, for geopolitical supply reasons, whatever that is, certainly not demand. Then it, if that pressures gasoline again, given what we've already seen in gas falling from gasoline prices where they were just a couple months ago, can you imagine what more that will do to the rest of the economy? I mean, that's really what, what we're starting to, to, to really factor here is not just the geopolitical risk in terms of energy, but it's geopolitical risk at a time in the economy. We can't afford it. We've got all of these other things, all these other negative pressures that we've been building, that have been building and building and building under the surface for months and months and months. 
And that's where you get to the point where you think, well, this thing could really just quite, it could just fall down really quickly. And that would be, that would be the moment of course, where the, the central bankers say, yes, you're saying, oh, we didn't do that. That was no, no, no. That's, that was something else. We just wanted, we were going to get to the soft landing, but we, you know, it wasn't our fault that we missed it. Yeah, exactly, Jeff. And, and if you use an analogy, you know, you're, you're, I know you just got back from a conference, so you're flying into the airport and, you know, you, they, they let you know, hey, we're going to start, you know, cruising down and, and gliding in. And you think, OK, this is a central banker, right? Pilot of the airplane saying we're going to come in this nice, smooth landing. We've got it all lined up. We're positioned right. We've got it thrown back. Dave, if I see a central banker in the cockpit, I'm not getting on that airplane. I'm sorry. This is not a good analogy. <laughs> oh, come on. Even if Janet Yellen was in the cockpit. Cockpit, Jeff, come on. We know you love Janet Yellen. But nevertheless, you, you see the plane gliding down, then all of a sudden it hits like an air pocket and drops. And that's kind of what we're saying here. It may not be a conflict in the Middle East. It may be something else or somewhere else. But the problem is the economy is slowing too quickly now, and the central bankers aren't reacting. And it can take just sometimes just a little nudge too hard in one direction. And next thing you know, the whole thing just drops from the sky. Yeah, I think it's incomes. We always come back to incomes. The nominal incomes have been slowing all summer. And lo and behold, we see all this other stuff happening during the summer into the fall. I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot. It's not a big stretch here. But as you say, I mean, you say this all the time, Steve. They're not just flying in the plane. If there's a central banker in the cockpit, they're looking backward. They're trying to fly forward because they're always looking at CPI data that's in arrears. They're going to be looking at retail sales figures and other economic accounts that are you know, they take a while to tabulate. They take even longer to show up in a trend. So by the time that they realize that we're heading down, you know, we've hit some kind of air pocket, we're already at the bottom of the air pocket. They don't really notice it until until the, the airplane actually crashes. So in, in the wreckage at the bottom of, the, of this cycle here, they'll say, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, be on the lookout for this. Well, that's just because they need new models, more PhD economists, new things that there was just something they didn't factor this time that they didn't know about much. Same reason why they didn't see the banking crisis earlier this year. But nevertheless, we know that they will always have an excuse to get out of this. We're we'll curious to see that we've got the next Fed meeting coming October 1st, uh, 31st, November 1st. Will Jay mention anything about gasoline prices or a slowing economy? Jeff, I'm going to go with no on that one. Yeah, so we have a major gas problem in the United States on top of everything else, but it's not the gas problem that everybody thinks it is. After the quote-unquote red-hot CPI for September, we're really set up for the opposite. And I wish that was the good news here because falling gasoline prices do offer some relief except for why they're falling, and it's not rate hikes. I keep mentioning incomes and how that leads into real big economic trouble. You want to see a video about that? Check out the one linked below me. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University subscribers, and of course, our Eurodollar University members, some of whom you see next to me. Until next time, take care.